The battle for Okinawa has already dragged on longer than Iwo Jima or Saipan. The war seems endless. Some units are on the front lines for almost four straight weeks under constant bombardment. I can't send any more boys out there to get killed. And now we take you to Honolulu. Four, two, three, four. Hello, NBC. Hello, NBC. This is KTU in Honolulu, Hawaii. I am speaking from the roof of the advertiser public company building. We have witnessed this morning the distant view of the battle off Pearl Harbor and a severe bombing off Pearl Harbor by enemy planes, undoubtedly Japanese. The city of Honolulu has also been attacked and considerable damage done. This battle has been going on for nearly three hours. The Japanese press is taking a seemingly bold attitude toward the United States today, following the announcement of the Three Power Alliance. The Tokyo newspaper, believed to reflect the government's views, claims America's State Department has mismanaged its affairs so badly that it has made an enemy of Japan. new tension has cropped up. Japan has made sudden and unexplained demands on French Indochina for bases which geographically have no importance in the war with China. The reports from Shanghai said that Tokyo had asked the government of Indochina to admit 50,000 more Japanese troops. These forces, declared the Japanese, are needed for the defense of the French colony. If Great Britain goes down, the Axis powers will control the continents of Europe and Asia and Africa and Australasia and the high seas. And they will be in a position to bring enormous military and naval resources against this hemisphere. It is no exaggeration to say that all of us in the Americas would be living at the point of a gun. The people of Europe who are defending themselves do not ask us to do their fighting. They ask us for the implements of war, the planes, tanks, the guns, the traitors, which will enable them to fight for their liberty and our security. There is no demand for sending an American expeditionary force outside our own border. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. For us, this is an emergency as serious 
as war itself. Philadelphia, 1939. There's a buzz building inside Municipal Stadium. A marching band warms up the crowd on a chilly December day. Then, military formations fill the field. First, the Army. Then, the Navy. Once the field is clear, the battle begins. This is the first known color film of the Army-Navy game. Colonel Wilbur Dockham shoots from his corner seat. Dockham captures it all on color film, a recent invention for home movie buffs, and combat cameramen. Dockham also films his army unit training at West Point. In 1939, America's military is not very robust. All the services combined have about 600,000 men. Training is sincere, but not always serious. I was a radio man. I only fired my rifle once the whole damn time I was in the Army. The Army figures less than half of its troops are properly trained. They're barely literate. 75% haven't finished high school, and 41% never started it. Americans greet their military with a collective shrug. When Dockham's unit parades through town, few people stop to watch. It's more sideshow than show of force. Waves of Japanese expansion have yet to reach here. Hawaii. The famous crossroads sign in Honolulu shows just how far it is from anywhere. In 1941, the U.S. Navy base at Pearl Harbor is just about the only sign that it's an American territory. Mostly, Hawaii hums to its own tune. This is the pre-war footage of Francis Raymond Line, a traveling filmmaker. His color film unspools like a perfect travel brochure. Hawaii has its own way of doing things. It's not used to cultural convulsions. Change usually comes on the slow boat. Francis Line's film paints Hawaii as nearly perfect. It's paradise framed by crashing waves. A roaring perimeter with wondrous views of the Pacific curving out of sight. Beyond Hawaii's horizon line, Japanese cameras film an armada secretly slicing its way through the Pacific. It's December 6, 1941. The American military is on alert, but not up to speed. On this very day, one unit has no hand grenades to practice with. Instead, they throw eggs. Also, on December 6th, newspaper ads call on congressmen to keep America out of the war across the Atlantic. It's the other ocean that's about to explode. Pearl Harbor goes to sleep, innocent and unscathed, for the last time. For everyone on the mainland, war remains abstract. For Hawaiians, it's real. 
Pearl Harbor still looks like it was flipped upside down. The beach is off limits, framed by barbed wire. The entire territory is under martial law. Thousands of school kids are registered, fingerprinted, and made to wear ID badges. Locals line up for ration cards and gas masks. Older kids practice how fast they can get them on. The youngest ones have to get into a full body bag. As if they aren't scared enough. More than a third of Hawaiians are of Japanese descent. They're nervous and trying to blend in by removing any signs of their ancestry. But here, there's no talk of mass internment. Such is not the case on the mainland. The Ishikawas are a fishing family, living in California. These are their home movies from before the war. They are Japanese immigrants, building a life on the American West Coast. But in 1942, that's just where a suspicious government doesn't want them. Takeo and Roberta Sharoma are children when the U.S. government puts their families on a train. We had to get rid of everything. We were given one month. People who live closer to the ocean, they only had 24 hours. They are headed inland to one of the 10 hastily built internment camps ordered by President Roosevelt at the start of the war. There would be two families in one room. When we got there, my mother had to stuff canvas bags with hay, which were to be our mattresses. I can't remember the food. I can remember not wanting to eat it. I would just look at it. They study, work, even join the military. The government rounds up more than 110,000 Japanese Americans, claiming it's for their own safety. They'll be calling this home, but they are not free. Before dawn, the Marines pour into the landing craft. As daylight breaks, the ships open fire above their heads to soften defenses. They pound the tiny island for four solid hours. Then, Navy planes take over. In all, Americans rip into Tarawa with over four million tons of steel. Johnny Singleton recalls the destruction. We thought after all our planes bombarding and attacking, there would be nothing left on the island. The Navy promised that they would have all the Japs killed by the time we got there. So we really weren't all that worried. The plan is to land the Marines on the island's northern beaches and move towards the key target, the airstrip at the center. Suddenly, incoming fire grazes the invaders.
Then, unexpectedly, the boats grind to a halt. Naval planners misjudge the tide. They expect five feet of water over the reef, but there's only three. Machine gun fire intensifies and mortars rain down. The men are sitting ducks. They have one choice, abandon ship or be blown out of the water. The Marines are forced to wade 700 yards under Japanese mortar and machine gun fire. They are being mowed down in rows. They fight their way onto the crowded beach. Men are pinned down in waves. Allied ships and planes unload another massive barrage onto the island. It appears to pay off. Only a few pockets of resistance remain. There wasn't any end, you just walked away. There wasn't anybody left to fight. Americans finally declare the island secure. Japan once boasted it would take a million men a hundred years to take Tarawa. America proved otherwise, but at a shocking cost. It takes three days of hard fighting, over 1,000 dead and 2,000 wounded, to capture an island of less than three square miles. Playing hide-and-seek with aircraft carriers is a new kind of warfare. With longer-range planes, the Japanese may strike first. The Battle of the Philippine Sea will be the biggest carrier battle in naval history. American radar picks up incoming planes. The Japanese have found them. Carriers scramble their F-6F Hellcats to meet them. The two massive navies are still hundreds of miles apart, so it comes down to one pilot against another in white-knuckle, split-second dogfights. American ships blast away from below. Japan made its planes lighter by shedding heavy armor. They gained range, but lost muscle. In aerial fistfights, they simply can't take a punch. American Hellcats shoot down over 20 planes from the first attack wave. Naval anti-aircraft fire hit a dozen more. One Japanese bomber scores a hit in the battleship South Dakota. 24 sailors are killed under a halo of smoke. Then, the second attack wave comes in. 128 planes. Navy pilot George Kirk joins the fray in his Hellcat. The Zero came and zoomed right in front of me. He was chasing another Hellcat. We crossed and I was able to light him up. I saved that other guy. This attack wave fares even worse than the first. They hit no ships at all, and many end up in the sea. By the time the fourth Japanese wave comes in, they are scattered and disorganized. Some don't even find the American fleet.
it's a complete route. Americans nickname it the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. For most Americans, Saipan is their first taste of the tropics. The heat and humidity can be oppressive. When allowed to pull back from the front, troops try to reset both mind and body. We hadn't had a bath in a month. You pulled off your socks, and most of your skin came off. Any chance to get halfway clean is a godsend. There's also do-it-yourself laundry. Clothes were so dirty, they'd stand up by themselves. With only one uniform, they make do. Any food that is not canned field rations is another treat. It's not home cooking, but it's still worth the wait. They would make a five-pound can of coffee in a barrel. It was the prettiest foam you ever saw. Some of the best cup of coffee I ever had in my life was on that island. Downtime gives the men a chance to swap stories and compare battle souvenirs. Jack Lent even commandeers a Japanese bike to visit some buddies in another unit. They said, how in the world did you get up here? I said, I rode right up that main road. They said, we haven't captured it yet. I went right through the Japanese lines on a bicycle. I think I went back at 90 miles an hour. By the third day of the invasion of Okinawa, there is still no sign of the enemy. Commanding General Simon Buckner sends a message to the Marines. All restrictions removed on your advance northward. Men and materiel move up the island and into the Motobu Peninsula, a mountainous no man's land. They approach a high, craggy mass called Mount Yetake. Suddenly, fire comes from everywhere. Americans are pinned down by mortars and machine guns no matter where they go. Companies get split up running for cover. They barely know where to return fire. After days of easy and rapid advance, casualties pile up by the hundreds. That was an old artillery training ground, Okinawa, and they knew every foot of the island. They could drop a shell any place they saw us. After almost a week of uphill fighting, there is little to show for it, except for blood and bandages. The Japanese have the advantage. In the midst of this nightmare, news reaches the front lines. On Mount Yetake, officers rally the troops with a new strategy. Attack from two directions, pinch them into a high, tight spot, then use air and artillery strikes to pummel the 1,200-foot mountaintop. It's an uphill slog against what one officer calls a phantom enemy. For four more days, they slowly move up the mountain under withering fire. Then, Marines finally take the top of Mount Yetake and take a look around. 2,000 Japanese bodies litter the peaks, trenches, and tunnels. Almost to a man, they had fought to the death. This one mountain top cost the Marines almost a thousand men. It was their first test against the Japanese defenses on Okinawa, and they wonder if they've only scratched the surface. What started as a cakewalk has become a meat grinder. Okinawa is becoming the Pacific Theater's black hole. Then, from the European theater, 
news breaks. Throughout the world, throngs of people hail the end of the war in Europe. The world celebrates. Hitler is dead. Germany surrenders and Europe is at peace. But on the other side of the world, Japan still won't budge. The battle for Okinawa has already dragged on longer than Iwo Jima or Saipan. The war seems endless. Combat fatigue spreads like a disease. Some units are on the front lines for almost four straight weeks under constant bombardment. Through May, nearly 14,000 troops are pulled back with what the military calls non-battle injuries. We had a lot of people who had what we call a thousand-yard stare, just looking off, not thinking anything. We lost a few that were just completely gone. First Lieutenant Charles Kilpatrick sees one officer hit the wall. And he just broke down. He said, I can't do it anymore. I can't send any more boys out there to get killed. Until they crack the Shuri line, they're trapped in a slaughterhouse. The Shuri line is an eight mile wide coast to coast killing zone. This is where America realizes the brutal truth. The Japanese are no longer fighting to win. They only want to turn the conquest of Okinawa into a drawn out bloodbath and give America second thoughts about invading mainland Japan. As April turns to May, it's working. Between bombed out buildings is a sure sign that war has moved on. The USO has moved in. Hollywood stars and servicemen and women meet face to face, 7,000 miles from home. Comedian Joe E. Brown has come to boost their morale. His comic rubber-faced expressions translate all the way to the back row. Throughout the Pacific, the USO brings laughter to places that only recently knew horror. Touching down on this dusty airstrip on Tarawa, another celebrity. By now, Bob Hope has logged over 30,000 miles across the Pacific. At every stop, he and his troop are escorted to thousands of fans eagerly awaiting the show of a lifetime. Here he is, Bob Hope! By now, Hope knows the reality of life in the Pacific almost as well as the men. Thank you. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob Mosquito Network Hope. I really hope you enjoy our show today. We have a nice show here with Francis Langford, Jerry Colonna. I know you'll enjoy the girls. You remember girls? Hope is not the only one putting smiles on American faces. There are plenty of big stars and thousands of lesser known names. They perform show after show for homesick troops all over the Pacific. Wherever there's a USO show, war has passed. <laughs> 